Man, it has been forever and a day since I have done a scripted video. But let's give it a try, shall we? Back in November of 2019, I published a video called The Triple Timeline Theory as an attempt to explain the relationship between the three great powers of the Alpha Quadrant in Star Trek The Original Series. Today, I want to revisit this theory and leave it alone where it stands strong, but make a couple of adjustments where it could use it to take in new information where we've received it in the no less than six new seasons of canonical live action track that has been streamed since November of 2019. And we're currently in the midst of a seventh. When I first reviewed the Triple Timeline video, I was actually surprised as to how well the theory still holds up after almost four years. It does need a little bit of updating, but honestly, the basic structure still remains intact. So let's take a look at the first part of the theory. This is my personal theory as to resolving the apparent contradictions that we see in the various iterations of Trek, dealing with the history of the Romulan and the Klingon empires and their relationships with each other and the United Federation of Planets. Let's start with the basic facts as we know them. The first time we ever saw a cloaking device was in the original series episode Balance of Terror, at which point it seemed quite clear that the Federation had never encountered cloaking technology before. The cloaking device was on an unnamed ship, referred to in all the contemporary material of the day, such as scripts, catalogs, licenses for models, etc., as the Romulan Bird of Prey. Approximately two years later, in the original series episode, The Enterprise Incident, due to damage to the Bird of Prey model used for the production of the visual effects, well, the team replaced the iconic Romulan ship with the Klingon D7 model. The only on-screen explanation was that Federation intelligence learned that Romulans had begun using Klingon designs. Some 16 years after that, for the first time, with but a single line uttered by Mr. Sulu in Star Trek III, The Search for Spock, we learned two very important facts. First, that the Klingons now indeed had a ship called a Bird of Prey. And second, that the Klingons now apparently have cloaking technology comparable to the Romulans. Klingon Bird of Prey, sir. She's arming torpedoes. Now, there was zero, and I mean zero, on-screen explanation for the change in the Klingons. However, in Star Trek IV, it was granted very subtly, but it was hinted at that the Klingon Bird of Prey was likely a new type of ship, and that the cloaking technology was something new to the Klingon Empire, or at least somewhat unexpected from Kirk and his crew. It's bad enough to be court martial and spend the rest of our lives mining borite, but to have to go home in this Klingon flea trap. We can learn a thing or two from this flea trap. It's got a cloaking device that costs us a lot. Now, keeping in mind that at the time, there was no other Star Trek besides the original series, the animated series, and the first four Star Trek films, this was all the information we had. And the fans came up with the Klingon Romulan Alliance theory that to many fans, to this day, is the prevailing theory to explain most of these events. The theory goes briefly something like this. Sometime in the 23rd century, the Federation was growing in strength, both politically and militarily. The Klingons found themselves facing the possibility of actually losing a war with the Federation. At the same time, the Romulans had managed to develop two major breakthroughs in their scientific research as far as military is concerned. They began developing plasma-based weapons that did a huge amount of damage, albeit with the drawback of limited range, and cloaking technology, which negates the limited range problem by allowing a Romulan ship to get into point-blank range before firing the weapon. The new Romulan Bird of Prey was commissioned, and the Romulan flagship was sent on a test mission to attack Federation outposts along the neutral zone. This was to test both the power of the new weapon and the effectiveness 
of their new cloaking device. The Romulans lost their first engagement with the Federation, as they did not take into account the superior speed and sensor technology of the Federation. In a move of desperation, leaders of the Klingon Empire and the Romulan Star Empire met and discussed their mutual enemy of the Federation. They came into a pact. The Romulans would provide the Klingons with cloaking technology, while the Klingons would provide the Romulans with improved warp drive. Now, the Klingon D7 at the time was widely considered, in terms of speed at the very least, on par with the Federation. So the way that this exchange took place was that the Klingons provided the Romulans with several D7 battlecruisers, while the Romulans gave the Klingons a squadron of Bird of Prey class scout ships. The Romulans used the D7 cruisers in their fleet at first, but eventually adapted the Klingon warp drive technology to work with their quantum singularity, power sources, and we ended up with the Dideridex class ship. Now, what's interesting about the Dideridex class ship is that if you look at a Dideridex class side by side with a Klingon D7, you should be able to see the fact that Number one, the warp nacelles are virtually identical, and the general shape of the Dideridex and the D7 is pretty much the same, except that the Dideridex has some additional structural parts underneath the warp nacelles. Meanwhile, the Klingons adapted the birds of prey that they received from the Romulan Empire and put Klingon bridge modules onto the Romulan ships and eventually incorporated cloaking technology into the entire Klingon fleet. This exchange successfully explained all the issues involved with the Klingons having a bird of prey in the fleet, as well as the cloaking device, and also kind of filled the gap as to what Starfleet intelligence had actually learned when they discovered Romulan D7 battlecruisers. For a good while, the fans, all of the fans, were perfectly happy with this explanation. Then came Enterprise. It's a Klingon bird of prey. In addition, to the Klingons now having a bird of prey about 100 years before the supposed alliance, we also find out that the Federation encountered cloaking technology about 100 years before the Battle of the Neutral Zone from Balance of Terror. First, the Sulaban. I wouldn't advise using your weapons, Jonathan. Perhaps if we decloak, you'll understand why. And later, yes, 100 years prior to Kirk and Spock discovering that Romulans had cloaking devices. We will not tolerate espionage. DePaul report. <sighs> oh, and to make matters worse, this is before the Romulan War. You know, the war that Spock said was fought in primitive space vessels. Previously on Enterprise. From what I've heard about these Romulans, they mean business. We have to find some way to stop them, or next time they might come back with a thousand of those ships. So these primitive ships that Spock was referring to apparently include one other interesting vessel, the ship that is referred to as a modified warbird, even though the ship doesn't look like any other Romulan design we've ever seen. And this ship is remote controlled, is able to outmaneuver any other ship we've ever seen in Trek before or since. This ship can outmaneuver any ship we have ever seen on Trek. It can dodge incoming torpedoes with ease. This ship is faster than any other ship that existed at the time, unless you push the engines past the red line in order to try and keep up with them. This was over the top. The Romulans had such a technological edge that quite frankly, if they had decided to invade the entire Alpha Quadrant, by all rights, they should have won. And add a hundred years of technology on top of that by the time we get to the Battle of the Neutral Zone? Why is this Romulan bird of prey, or whatever we want to call it, not the most powerful ship ever? Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. This just f***s up everything. About the only thing that is still intact from the original fan theory is that the Klingons don't have cloaking devices before... 
Oh, come on. I mean, what the f I mean, seriously, what the <sighs> So now it would seem that the only real way to reconcile all of this is to actually suggest that Captain Kirk and Mr. Spock are both completely ignorant of the history of the Romulan War, despite the fact that in the episode Balance of Terror, Spock looked up the history of the Romulan War so that he could share it with the entire crew of the Enterprise. <sighs> and on top of that, Kirk and Spock are apparently completely unaware of the fact that the Federation was almost completely wiped out by a fleet of cloaked Klingon ships just 10 years before this incident. Oh, and did I mention that Spock was not only serving in Starfleet at that time during the war, but his sister was a key figure in the same war. Fortunately, Enterprise may have actually provided the seeds to a new theory that can fix all of this. Annihilate us before we can annihilate them. Why are you telling me this? The Zindi were not supposed to learn about their future. If they deploy this weapon, it will contaminate the timeline. This is going to be an update to a theory I suggested once before, but now I think all the pieces are in place to make it really the only viable solution to our canon issues. We start with what we will refer to as the Prime Timeline. It's only called the Prime Timeline because it is the first timeline that we ever get to witness. In this timeline, the events of Star Trek the original series take place exactly as we see in the show. The Klingon Romulan Alliance takes place exactly as fans originally thought, leading to the Klingons developing the Bird of Prey sometime in between the events of the original series and Star Trek 3, the Romulans using D7s, and eventually developing the Daredex class based on this whole exchange. What we do not see in the Prime Timeline, but must have taken place, is that there was a war between the Federation and the Romulan Empire sometime around 100 years prior to the original series. After the war, Klingons experimented with augment DNA to try and improve themselves and almost wipe themselves out. But in the process of stopping the plague that almost killed them, they temporarily removed the signature bumpy foreheads from themselves, and these bumps reemerged sometime shortly after the events of the original series. And, well, you know the rest. Then, the Borg attacked during the events of the film Star Trek First Contact. The Enterprise E went back in time to the 21st century to stop the Borg from assimilating Earth in the past. While they were ultimately successful, Zephyrin Cochran learned of the existence of the Borg and his partner Lily actually witnessed the Borg firsthand. After Cochran's successful warp test flight, he tried to convince the world and the world's new allies, the Vulcans, of the existence of time-traveling cyborgs from the future who wanted to enslave all life. While Publicly, nobody believed him. The word spread to other cultures and some began to take his warning seriously. He mentioned a group of cybernetic creatures from the future who tried to stop his first warp flight when he was living in Montana. No one took him seriously. And he recanted the whole thing a few years later, but you have to admit, there are similarities. The Romulans began pushing everything they had into developing weapons and stealth technology and managed to develop the cloaking device over 100 years earlier than they did in the Prime timeline. The Klingons, also hearing about this and being somewhat concerned about the possibility of the Romulans gaining an upper hand, began developing their own weapons technology very, very early on. The Klingons and Romulans both realized that if this was a common threat, that they should work together. They formed a brief alliance, similar to the alliance in the Prime timeline, and they began sharing technology much, much earlier. Although the Klingons did not develop the cloaking device until sometime after the events of the series Enterprise. But the Romulans and Klingon militaries were so busy building up defenses against a potential Borg attack, the war with the Federation and the Romulan Empire never took place. For the Klingons, while they attempted the same augment DNA experiments that they tried in the Prime Timeline, this time they were cured by Dr. Phlox. The Klingons still being concerned about the potential of not only Earth growing in power, but the Borg threat, made a second attempt 
and this time, using hindsight from the prior attempt, filtered out the specific genes that caused the viral problem. This resulted in the Klingons becoming an entire race of augments. Their physical appearance changed drastically, and they ended up becoming the Klingons that we see in Star Trek Discovery. Okay, I have to interrupt here because this is where the original theory breaks down a bit. What does not quite work at this point is that the augment part of the theory, well, just, well, let's just get into it. In Strange New World Season 2, Episode 1, we see Klingons that look very much like the Klingons from prior to the Augment virus. So, simply suggesting that they all changed into what we saw in Star Trek Discovery is obviously incorrect. That being said, I do believe that a clue as to how to adjust the theory is provided in this episode of Strange New Worlds. Three Klingons approaching. Copy. Is that Klingon there speaking? I do not recognize it. Kach Ulch, I think. It's a pretty obscure dialect, but I can make out the syntax. This scene shows us that while we do see Klingons that look more classical in appearance, they are also speaking a very obscure dialect of the Klingon language. How obscure? Well, the Kach Ulch dialect itself may or may not be especially rare, but the computer system that has all the information that the Federation has on the Klingons can only verify 41% accuracy. So the language being spoken may or may not even be the Kach Ulch, but some derivative of it. So the update to the theory is this. The first part remains the same. Sometime around 2154, the Klingons experimented with augment DNA to try and improve their species, but created a virus that nearly killed them, and thanks to Dr. Phlox, they managed to defeat the virus at the cost of their cranial ridges. About 50 years later, in 2207, another group of Klingon scientists took the experimental data and created a new Klingon augment virus, but integrated Dr. Phlox's data to try to prevent some of the issues. And they came up with the Uber Klingons, larger, stronger, more aggressive. These Uber Klingons quickly rose to power and took control of all the major houses of the empire. By 2256, the Uber Klingons had full control of the empire and led by and later inspired by the martyrdom of Takuvma, a religious zealot, they waged a deadly war with the United Federation of Planets, nearly wiping the Federation out. These uber Klingons, however, were not all the Klingons in the Empire. They were simply the ones who took control at that point. Since the dialogue in Strange New Worlds says in the bro Broken Circle states that the Klingon dialect was obscure, it would stand to reason that the Klingons we see in this episode were from the further reaches of the Empire, and thus not affected by the Uber Klingon virus. Using this template, there are several ways you could take this theory, depending on how you want to take the story of the Klingon Empire in this timeline. One was that you could make the argument that the Uber Klingon virus made most of the Klingons who were infected with it sterile, and thus they died out in one generation, which is why we don't see them shortly after Discovery. Or you could make the idea that there are now three competing factions of Klingon subspecies, the Uber Klingons, the Classic Klingons, and the Smooth-Headed Klingons, all vying for power. That way they could all make appearances in future episodes of Strange New Worlds. Depending on the direction, the writers have endless possibilities. Now, let's get back to the theory as it originally was. Meanwhile, in Starfleet, because of Cochrane's rantings about the Borg, the Vulcans became much more hesitant to share technology with Earth, worried that humans were mentally unstable. Keep in mind that Vulcans of this era patently believed that time travel was an impossibility. As I've told you, the Vulcan Science Directorate has concluded that time travel is impossible. Well, good for the Vulcan Science Directorate. Therefore, they withheld advanced warp technology, so Earth's ships were significantly slower 
than in the prime timeline. However, due to the fact that Earth was forced to do their own research and development rather than depend on Vulcan technology, Earth began developing weapons and sensors much differently than in the prime timeline, leading first to the Enterprise era and later the Discovery era of Trek. While not much is known about the alternate timeline after the events of Star Trek Discovery Season 2 as of this writing, we do know that sometime in the 24th century a supernova threatens to destroy the entire galaxy, and in a vain attempt to save Romulus, Spock and a Romulan named Nero are sent back in time and end up shortly before the events of Discovery, and a third timeline is spawned, known commonly as the Kelvin timeline. So in this particular rework of Trek history, the Kelvin timeline is an offshoot of the timeline that was created from the events of First Contact. This is why the Kelvin timeline and what we see in Star Trek Discovery look so similar. So there you have it. Three timelines, the Prime timeline, the First Contact timeline, and the Kelvin timeline, explaining not only the problems with Klingons having the ship class bird of prey a hundred years early, or the Romulans having cloaking devices a hundred years early, but also explains the radical changes to Trek that we saw in the events of Star Trek Discovery and in the Kelvin timeline. So tell me, what do you think? Personally. I think it's the only way to logically explain all of this and still remain true to the in-universe canon that we see in the Trek incarnations. But I'm very curious to see what your thoughts are. Am I completely nuts? Or does this relatively simple and I believe elegant solution to the massive continuity issues that we see in the unfortunate canon violations of the prequel series Enterprise, Discovery, and of course the unfortunate Kelvin timeline films, does this really resolve it all? I think it does. One final footnote I'd like to add to the theory, since I know some people ask, are things like, hey, which timeline does Picard fit in? and what about the fact that Seven of Nine knew about the Borg at first contact? Well, the latter is simple. Seven knew about the Borg presence at first contact because the Borg, through the Queen, are aware of events in alternate timelines. Don't believe me? Well, go back and watch Picard Season 2. Speaking of Picard, at a glance, I would tend to say that Picard Seasons 1 and 2 are in the Borg timeline, while Picard Season 3 is in the Prime timeline. This is mainly based on the design of the Constitution-class starships as seen in those seasons. I also want to address one objection that a good friend of mine tends to levy every time I mention this theory. And that is the simple fact that they don't like the idea that Enterprise, a really solid Star Trek show in its own right, would be placed in the realm of an alternate timeline. Well, sure, that's true. But then all of Star Trek is in an alternate timeline from our own. And quite frankly, does it really matter I don't think it does, because Star Trek has dealt with alternate timelines throughout its history. And quite frankly, I think that Enterprise is no better or worse a show if it's in the Prime timeline or the Borg timeline. I happen to think Enterprise is a pretty darn good show, and I think that a lot of people that throw hate at it, well, are just kind of being jerks. That being said, you know, I get it. Some people don't like the idea of putting their show in an alternate timeline. But it's not about whether Enterprise is a good show or a bad show. It's about where it fits. And the simple fact is that things like the Romulan cloaks, the Sulaban cloaks, and other technological issues with Enterprise simply make it fit much better in an alternate timeline than in the prime timeline. Simply put, Enterprise takes place way too early to have the advanced technology that they have on that show. If Enterprise took place, say, 
20 to 30 years prior to the original series instead of 100 years prior to the original series, then the technology would be about right. So, let me know if you guys think that it might be worthwhile to redo a full new video on the alternate timeline theory concept that I originally published in 2019 that this is kind of an update to. Or, at this point, is Star Trek just too messy to clean up? Take care, and God bless.